Hello, and thank you all for being here, and thanks to everybody who helped set this up. I'm Aram Sinreich. I'm a professor here at the School of Communication, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Harlow Holmes, the Director of Newsroom Digital Security for the Freedom of the Press Foundation to the School of Communication. Um, I was at a cyber event last week. Uh, Harlow and I were just talking about this, and it was kind of amazing seeing how people in policy circles think about cybersecurity. Because for them, cybersecurity is an issue that affects American business and American foreign interests uh, and American uh, military and defense issues. And for them, the whole conversation, I was in a room full of 30 very, very highly placed cybersecurity officials from both government and private industry uh, for about two hours. And the whole conversation was about whether uh, cybersecurity could be achieved by the government regulating businesses or whether it could be achieved by some kind of formal training of the populace to look after their own cybersecurity on behalf of uh, the businesses that they're the customers of. And I raised my hand at a certain point and I said, you know, I think maybe we're talking across purposes, but I think you guys are missing something really important, which is that cybersecurity is about people. And it's about the relationships between people that takes place via technology. It's not about the technology itself or the companies that make and distribute the technology. And so cybersecurity is fundamentally a cultural issue. And we're not going to solve the enormous problems that face our industries, our democracy, our society um, in the realm of cybersecurity without fundamentally changing our cultural approach to data as a crucial and increasingly central element of the way that we mediate our relationships to one another. Um, now, a couple of years ago, I was doing research with this strange new uh, religion that emerged in Sweden and elsewhere around the world called Kapamism. And Kapamists basically believe that sharing information is a devotional and holy act, and that God loves information and wants us to make more of it. And that's our job on this planet. And they even believe that the internet is a holy religious artifact and that file sharing is a devotional act. And um, if you think that's wacky or kooky, uh, that's your right. You wouldn't be the only one. But one of the things that I love about Kapamism as a community is that they do think about data culturally. They do think about data as a means of connection between human beings and not as uh, an artifact of industry or as a national security matter. And they have this beautiful term that they use to talk about the role that data plays between us. It's called data love. And so I ask them questions. I say, well, you know, when is it permissible to copy information? When is it permissible uh, to keep information to yourself? How do you navigate between freedom of speech and security? How do you navigate between privacy and openness? And their answer is data love, right? Because once you've internalized the logic of data, you can feel when it's right to share and when, is it, when it isn't. And there are no hard and fast laws. Uh, and there are no regulations that can do this as well as communities of human beings working together can. So what I'm excited about uh, in having Harlow here is knowing her work as I do and having seen her in front of my students. She was kind enough to come down last year and speak to my digital media and culture undergraduate class. Um, I know that her view of data security is one rooted in data love uh, and not purely rooted in uh, kind of commercial or political motivation. She's going to talk about politics and commerce, but fundamentally, I think we are very lucky to have somebody here who understands data security as a cultural issue. And that's what I'm most looking forward to. Thanks so much for being here. Thank Anna. you very much for having me. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks very much everyone for having me here today and I am incredibly excited uh, to talk about digital security with you. We're going to talk about like the fundamentals. We're going to talk mostly about what I like to call low hanging fruit. Um, a lot of things that you can do to keep yourself secure right now, but also helps you understand how this has an impact in all of our lives um, as a whole. So. Uh, in my line of work, um, there is one um, kind of methodology that we teach and we want people to, to get a handle of. 
called threat modeling. What it is is it's um, a method by which you ask yourself a couple of questions. You're going to learn a couple of new jargony terms, but uh, you ask yourself a couple of questions, and then uh, you look at your relationship to your devices, to you know your data, um, and uh, um, kind of give yourself better options to uh, make yourself more secure from a play, from a stance of empowerment rather than a stance of fear. Uh, so I'm going to just walk you through this methodology real quick. And you can, this applies to absolutely everything, not just digital security. OK, so we have these jargony terms. First off, you have assets. What are the things that I have to protect? So in the digital security sense, this could be anything from a password, right? Or uh, access to you know, email or perhaps the contents of you know, your doctoral thesis or something like that. Um, then you have to ask yourself, from whom? Who are these adversaries? Who is sufficiently motivated in order to get those assets from you? Uh, then you ask yourself about the resources that this adversary would have. What kind of skill does this adversary have? How much time does your adversary have? Um, sometimes where skill is not available, that can be uh, supplanted with money. So uh, if someone has not a lot of skill to you know, get into your bank account, but they can invest the money to have someone else do it, or you know, something like that, then they might succeed. Um, and of course, you have to ask yourself about the consequences. So what happens if my adversary succeeds with whatever resource they have? Does that mean that I'm going to have to spend several hours online with my bank trying to figure out an identity theft problem? Does it mean that the, um, you know, the contents of my email are dropped uh, online and people make fun of me based, based off of something I said? Um, and I mean, those are kind of scary questions, but then you ask yourself the, f the, the final question, the fifth and final question, which is, how far am I willing to go to protect these things? Um, and sometimes it's, especially because you know, the first couple of questions are kind of daunting, um, giving yourself the time to answer the fifth one with you know, the, a lot of the tools and, and tricks we're going to learn today um, will definitely serve you in the future. All right, so once again, low-hanging fruit. But uh, the first thing people want to know is how to secure their accounts, basically. So as much as possible, I try to say pass phrases rather than pass words. Pass words should be a thing in a, of the past. And like you are going to hear me say it a little bit during uh, this, this talk today, but like I still have to remind myself that it's pass phrases, not passwords. So um, infamously, uh, any you know, like simple eight-letter password, even if it has the letters, the numbers, the special characters, there's nothing wrong with using them. However, that is not what's keeping your account safe. Um, ultimately, a uh, contrast that with an eight-word phrase, which actually takes like centuries to uh, att to actually uh, attack. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, this is a really, really cool password checker. We're gonna go through this in a minute, um, but I wanna like, you know, hip you up to some uh, lingo. Uh, brute force. A brute force uh, attack, especially as far as a password is concerned, is when uh, your a hacker, maybe incredibly skilled or maybe not skilled, uses a, um, a piece of software in order to try the um, uh, all possible letters, numbers, special characters, all those things in order to find out what the password is. And computers nowadays are really, you know, the software exists, the software is free and widely available. Um, uh, computers nowadays are actually really, really good at brute force attacking uh, people's passwords. So let's do a little bit of a demo. This is kind of my favorite thing. Um, first off, never, as it says, enter your real password into a password checker. Um, that's another rule about securing your accounts. You only want you know, the, uh, the, your password to be accessible to the service that you're using. So. Um, render unto Google that which belongs to Google, right? So um, let's say, uh, I, I, this is a, a story that I like to tell a lot. Um, when I was in high school, that was my password on absolutely everything, because uh, I liked that book. I liked that, those series of books. 
And it says here that um, this password would have, which would have been on my school email account, maybe on like, I don't know, my FAFSA application, I, like all sorts of things, would have been brute forced in approximately 55 seconds. Um, the reason why I like to show people this is, uh, this is a perfect way to not only learn about passwords, but to learn about threat modeling. So it says it takes 55 seconds for a MacBook Pro to do this password cracking. Um, a MacBook Pro like a lot of you have in front of you right now. Um, but that represents a certain type of relationship between adversaries, resources, and assets. One person having a MacBook Pro uh, working really hard to get into my high school email probably represents a, a certain type of, of adversary. It's probably someone who is personally motivated, who want, like a bully who would want to embarrass me because you know, I had written something in my email. Um, and it would, you know, with the resource that that person has, take them that 55 seconds. However, we also have uh, other metrics to look at. So if you see um, right underneath it, the botnet only takes one second to crack that same password. And for those of you who aren't aware, a botnet um, is a, a, a bunch of computers. So imagine several thousand uh, MacBook Airs or even nowadays like internet connected toasters um, working together in Congress in order to solve a particular problem together. And you, as you can see, because you're throwing more computing power at this particular problem, it only takes one second, if not less, to crack the same weak password. And so let's go back to our threat modeling uh, metrics once again. That botnet represents a different type of adversary. Perhaps it's a criminal organization. Uh, they are probably not um, you know, like motivated by like hatred or meanness or cruelty or whatever targeted towards me in order to get into um, whatever account this is. But uh, perhaps it's an impersonal, you know, kind of let's see how many bank accounts we might be able to get into today uh, by renting some time on a criminal organization's botnet or something like that. So, <clears throat> but let's get back. So now that I've scared you <laughs> enough about having really small passwords, short passwords, what should you do is now the question. Um, so this is where the passphrases come, come in handy. Uh, that if you know you can uh, imagine uh, taking I don't know five six seven eight who knows uh, random words that you can get from a variety of places there are like a bunch of games that you play with dice in order to pick these random words uh, I know people who actually go to their library and find you know several random books and you know actually like. Uh, do it that way, you put them all together and using your power of imagination as we humans have, uh, put together you know, some sort of story that might uh, actually you know, tr trigger your memory in order to um, type in this passphrase. And that, same, that simple trick, just a very, very simple trick, now means that you have passwords that are conceivably uncrackable. So if my uh, adversary is, you know, now tasked with correct horse battery staple, you get the idea. It's going to take this person, it's going to take all of my conceivable adversaries way much more time uh, than, <laughs> than ever needed uh, in order to get my, into whichever account. And as actually for a, um, an individually motivated uh, adversary, they're probably going to be dead by the time that you know, this actually happens for them. So um, that said, there's, you know, there's more. So um, you have this like really, really great password uh, idea, but passwords are still really, really hard to memorize. It's, it's just kind of a fact. Um, but the thing is you should never ever reuse passwords because uh, let's you know, take that example. Since I was in high school using the same password on absolutely everything, then um, maybe you know the, uh, the the type of adversary who has access to this botnet doesn't really care about my high school email, but will definitely try to see if that password and username combination is used on a variety of other accounts, some of which are more financially lucrative than others. So when you hear about, and this happens all the time, when you hear about you know some service, some website guy 
got hacked, all the passwords are on the dark web or whatever. Um, while you might not care about that particular service, fair enough, uh, just know that when you reuse passphrases, hackers are going to use those to try to uh, get into an account that, that's a little bit better. So what we do is we use password managers. Um, and I believe this university actually gives you access to uh, a password manager, like, for instance, LastPass or 1Password. Um, so what this does is it actually uh, allows you to store a, a pretty virtually unlimited amount and also generate, uh, without you having to get books or dice or whatever, random passwords uh, that you, know, you store in there and just kind of call upon whenever you need them. And that takes away the, uh, the, the, the burden of memorizing things because uh, you're pretty much letting this password manager do the memorization for you. So uh, that said, we do have to uh, remember one thing. So as the name of these services, you have the one password that you're, you know, that's the last password you'll ever need. It's that one, you know, password that we've derived that we can type or speak or, you know, uh, share with customer service or whatever um, that opens that password database for you. Um, so finally, or maybe not finally, but like another, you know, little bit of low hanging fruit is using two factor authentication. And I can imagine that uh, you're already familiar with that. Uh, a lot of banks have it. Uh, your school IT department actually might harass you if you haven't enabled it on your account. But it's actually on a, a growing number of accounts all over the place. So it's not only for this bank and it's not only for your school account. Um, but real quick, two-factor authentication is based off the idea that you know there's something that you know or something your computer knows if it's this if you're in a, using a password manager, and something that you have, and only the combination of those two things um, should be able to prove that it is authentically you that's trying to get access to a service. So the something that you have is usually nowadays represented by our mobile phones. Um, which is a very, very interesting cultural artifact. Uh, the idea that our phones are so much a part of our life that they actually, but like de facto stand-ins for our, our own identities. Um, so there are some caveats, though. Uh, by the way, this website is amazing. It's called twofactorauth.org, and it is a resource where you can research whichever you know uh, whichever accounts your bank accounts your paypal your amazon your s streaming services your you know whatever uh, and uh, find out exactly how to enable uh, two-factor authentication so when you do a search for something like let's say your gmail uh, the first the immediate column uh, to you know, the, the right of the service is the documentation. This is a direct link that goes to the documentation where you can enable two-factor auth. And then the subsequent cells actually represent the different ways you can get two-factor authentication. So a lot of people are definitely familiar with the SMS message, right, for two-factor auth code. Um, that is problematic nowadays. And while it's can be better than nothing, you know, because if you want to, if you have two factor auth as an option, you should definitely enable it. Using the SMS can be actually abused uh, in or by attackers in order to harm people. And this, we see this a lot um, from in a variety of places. I'll explain exactly how this works. Um, so, if because you know the phone is such an integral part of our uh, of our lives, people's phone numbers are um, unfortunately like uh, privy to being uh, you know taken over or intercepted. So someone could call up you know Verizon or whatever, pretend to be you, and say, "I got a new phone. Um, you know, put make sure that the phone calls go to this new phone." And uh, if you know your carrier. Uh, or whoever you know answered the phone that day in customer service uh, 
fell, falls for this trick, you can actually have your, S your phone number uh, taken from you. And so what that means is now an attacker has, is receiving your second authentication codes. So um, especially in the United States, these are attacks that like uh, have plagued activists. So for instance, uh, Dere McKesson uh, last year, um, what had his, uh, uh, had his phone number taken over from him because someone was uh, pranking him. Um, the uh, the had a, or sorry, uh, someone at the FTC even had this happen to them because someone was just trying to buy a whole bunch of iPhones on her account. Um, but we also and so this is you know within the United States context, you're thinking about a certain type of adversary. Um, but also in, in other countries, uh, if, especially for people who are frequently traveling, know that the telecommunications industry is actually, uh, especially in other countries, are incredibly cozy with governments. So if you are a person of interest, um, it has been, you know, it has happened that uh, a government might say, I um, make sure that we also get all of this person's SMS messages when they visit and are now using our cell towers and having people's accounts taken over that way as well. So SMSs, not the best. Um, the same thing with the phone call, not the best. Uh, actually, a lot of times these services, uh, they will call you up. If you don't answer the phone, they will leave the two-factor auth code in your voicemail. And voicemail is incredibly easy to, to hack into. So if an attacker can hack into your voicemail and listen to that message that Gmail left you on your voicemail, that's another way that you can have your um, accounts taken over. So what do we do? I mean, that's scary, right? But now you're thinking about these at potential adversaries and the resources that they have. Um, we actually like the last two options, the software token and the hardware token. Uh, the software token actually refers to an app uh, called Google Authenticator, or there's another one called Authy, which is a lovely um, uh, alternative, uh, another one called Duo. There's a bunch of them. Um, but what it does is it actually uh, delivers your two-factor authentication codes via this app. And the cool thing about this is that uh, it doesn't require an internet connection. So if you don't have any bars and you're only on Wi-Fi and you need to log into something, you don't have to worry about receiving a text message. Um, it's also, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it is, there are ways for, you know, when you get a new phone in order to like migrate it over to this new phone, but still it takes like a little bit of, of getting used to. Um, and it's not, you know, uh, it's for the most part, uh, it isn't interceptable by certain adversaries. The best and coolest, I think, uh, is this little gadget, which is called a, the hardware token. Um, it's not a, like a USB stick or any, or sorry, a USB drive. It's just like a little USB dongle. Um, they even have the, it for like the newer ones and for NFC for Android people. Um, this works with Google Chrome, and very soon it'll be working with Firefox in, you know, about a month. Um, you, when you're, you know, logging into a site and it asks you for a second factor, you just do exactly that. You stick it in the computer, you give it a tap, and it uh, provides that second code. And this is actually the coolest. Um, the reason why uh, is it's uh, the most secure is actually has to do with, and we'll get to this a little bit later on, phishing attacks. So you, has anybody actually, raise your hand, has anybody ever been phished? <laughs> yeah, it, it happens. But if you find yourself, you know, with, and we'll get into the phishing a little bit later, but um, if ever you find yourself on someone's phishing site and you're typing in your, you know, really, really excellent, long and, you know, 12 word passphrase, um, and then you press enter and it asks for the second factor, the second factor that this USB uh, dongle spits out will not work on a phishing site. It will only work on the real Gmail you know, or Google.com or Dropbox or Facebook. Okay, uh, but let's take it back. Let's talk about just how the web works in general. So uh, this is kind of how the internet looked a little bit back in, you know, uh, I don't know, a decade ago, if not more. Um, we don't see this so much anymore, but we do. Okay, so 
Uh, let's imagine that this little cloud, this service provider in the middle is a uh, company like, I don't know, Facebook, right? So back before Facebook was Facebook.com and it was the Facebook.com, if anybody remembers those days. I do. Um, <laughs> so we have our service provider in the middle. And uh, on the ends, the ends, we have clients or endpoints. These are our phones. These are our computers. These are our toasters nowadays. Um, but uh, when this phone you know, says hi and then it, I press send, send it to my friend over Facebook who responds OMG smiley face, the service provider uh, in, you know, in the middle does get to see the content of those messages. It also um, has to know who it's from, who it's to, when, it's, when the messages came in, all those things. Um, we sometimes have a problem with that and we'll get to that, but that is to a certain extent what we expect. But as, the, uh, as this information travels over the internet, um, if the connection between these uh, devices and the service provider is not encrypted, is not secure, then everybody on the internet on its way to the service provider can see exactly the same thing. So that means uh, the people who, uh, who are all on the same network, let's say, like all of us, if we were all on the same Wi-Fi, we would have been able to read one another's messages. That's when you get into like those infamous hackers in cafe, you know, scary stories who's just sitting there looking at you, you know, logging into your bank accounts and stealing your passwords. Um, it also means, so that's a certain type of adversary. Um, who else can see it? Uh, the IT department. So uh, obviously uh, schools are in a huge position to monitor what people are doing on their network. And so if you know, you're saying something particularly interesting over this particular network, depending on what you say, uh, the people who administer this network can see the same thing. Um, it also means that your ISP, meaning like, you know, once again, our Verizons, our Comcasts, our Cox, you know, whomever you pay money to, to have access to the internet, they can even see this stuff too. Um, which is, you know, a, a little bit tr problematic to say the least. Uh, there actually a couple of months ago, there was this bill passed um, that allowed, you know, our, or uh, made it legal uh, for these service providers to uh, use this type of information to like even serve you more ads, which uh, is really interesting when you think about the fact that you pay them money to do these things. So there are ways to kind of remedy that problem and actually uh, when, oh, by the way, I mean, not only is this happening and the visibility into what people are saying is a problem, but it also it means that this stuff could potentially be modified. So someone could, uh, you know, uh, I have, uh, or sorry, I, there was a really cool art project where someone replaced, you know, people's Facebook profile pictures with something really obscene. Um, but and that's like a prank, but also that that the same ability to do that means that someone could um, put malware or, or something or, or tamper with the page in such a way in order to make your journey across the internet a lot less safe. So that was no longer uh, good. Um, and actually, Facebook was, is a company that uh, now, um, you know, obviously has, uh, offers encryption in transit. So there is a, a Facebook has a certificate they make sure that whenever you're interacting with Facebook, you are normally speaking, uh, going over HTTPS. Uh, so it's no longer HTTP, it's HTTPS. And what this means to you know, a certain extent is that now, um, while Facebook can definitely still see exactly what you and your friends are saying because they're serving you ads and you love it, um, but, uh, what they, uh, no one else along that route can see it. It's, uh, the traffic is encrypted between you and Facebook and between your friends and Facebook. So you're cutting out certain adversaries, the hackers in the cafe, the nosy IT department, um, et cetera. So this is important for a variety of reasons. 
Um, by the way, Freedom of the Press Foundation has a, uh, a project called Secure the News, where we're, in, we're encouraging um, newspapers to adopt this, to get a, an SSL certificate, to make sure that you can only access them behind HTTPS and there is a green lock or whatever um, in your browser's address bar in order to make sure that you understand this. Um, and the reason why uh, is, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. So on like the LA Times, let's say, when you visit the LA Times, not only does you know all those people do all those people understand that you're on the LA Times, they also have deep insight into exactly which article it is that you're reading. And that is one of the reasons why you know ad profiles are so rich. Um, when you're uh, visiting the New York Times and maybe even reading a very, very similar article, uh, only the fact that you're visiting the New York Times and nothing else beyond that slash is uh, visible to people, to eavesdroppers on the internet. Of course, the Times and all you know, uh, um, news companies definitely do create their ad profiles on you. And we'll get back to ad profiling in a minute. But um, from a, I mean, from you know, a security perspective, you can imagine that this actually, uh, or I guess the way I would put it is, uh, here in the United States, reading some, I, I might not care so deeply that someone knows that I'm reading about Marissa Mertz. Um, however, uh, if you know, in other situations in other countries, for instance, if you're in China and reading about Ai Weiwei, that might actually, that entire concept takes on like a different political weight. Okay, so let's get back to more practical stuff. We are uh, in, oh, sorry, uh, even though we're being advertised to and we kind of uh, only, you know, scratch the surface because we didn't get into the advertisement, um, aspect of all of this and why that matters. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's still, you know, like even if we're visiting an HTTPS encrypted uh, web page, there's still plenty of ways where um, our uh, identities and our data is tracked across the web. Um, primarily, I'm talking about cookies, although there's a couple of other things. Uh, the cookies are bits of data, little files that live in your browser and sometimes even on, you know, straight up on the hard drive uh, that kind of ha leave a trail of where you've been. And now there are good cookies and there are bad cookies. There are good cookies like the ones that keep us logged into Gmail each time we open up our computer or Facebook or whatever. Cookies also are how shopping carts work, which is fine. Um, but then there are bad cookies, which are third party cookies. Um, and third-party cookies are actually, you know, these are kind of the building blocks of advertising networks. So if you're on the LA Times and the LA Times has a relationship with this ad network that sets cookies, and then you move over to the New York Times and New York Times has the same relationship with that advertising network, the fact that you, since this third party owns both of the cookies that you saw on those sites, um, they can tie your activities across the web together. And this is how the majority of our very, very, very rich ad profiles are born. Um, so all of the browsers allow you to take a little bit more control of uh, things like cookies. So one, you may clear them. Um, this is in the historical data section of your, your browser. So you can clear them, the, the ones that you know you just set an hour ago, or you can clear all of them. Um, another thing that you have to do is you, uh, well, unfortunately, Chrome, which is a great browser, uh, makes it incredibly difficult for you to find it. But um, by digging in through the advanced, you can, one, um, turn off uh, what's called do not track, which is a, a, a standard, um, more like a promise that certain, you know, like uh, app, uh, ad networks won't follow you around. And also just simply disable third party cookies, which is actually the simplest uh, thing that you can do. Uh, that said, they're not always the, uh, there's still so much more to do. <laughs> so uh, ad technology is incredibly advanced and they are definitely trying all the rules in the book uh, and new rules are being written all the time. 
So uh, what we also recommend is working with a, uh, an ad blocker or a tracker blocker. Uh, so the EFF, the Electronic Front, uh, Frontier Foundation, has a really, really awesome uh, um, uh, offering called Privacy Badger, which doesn't block ads, but it does block the like trackers, which are kind of like invisible, you know, ad stuff. Um, and uh, a uh, simple, you know, blocker or ad blocker like Disconnect Me or You Block Origin something like that so it actually you know takes away the, uh, the the things that you do see and pages load a lot quicker uh, and you're not just being served up with uh, so much cruft now ad blockers can be incredibly um, contentious especially for people who are you know who are interested in engaging in uh, like a, a career in media um, advertising is a lot is pretty much how um, you know newspaper people who work in newspapers get paid so, um, all, like all good, uh, well-built products, you may, um, you know, whitelist certain sites. So, if you, it is important to you, or even if you know you want to read that article and you get a little pop-up saying, um, you know, uh, we see you're running an ad blocker, please turn it off or whatever. Uh, feel free to do that if you need to. Um, I guess the only the point is that now you have the tools to make a decision. Okay. So I got another thing about how the internet works. IP addresses <laughs> are places. Uh, they usually are like they usually point directly to places on this earth. Um, and so for a variety of reasons, that might be problematic. Um, one thing uh, or uh, one thing that we hear a lot about is like, you know, using uh, uh, unmasking and kind of stalking people around the internet by getting them to click on, you know, a particular like uh, news article that's sharing around in social media. There's actually like interesting uh, little games that you can play on people in order to put a legitimate article behind uh, or have it pass through this other web page that you don't actually see and someone grabs your IP address from it just to, you know, like depending on what that adversary is motivated to do. But it usually has to do with like, you know, stalking people. Um, so uh, when, you know, doing particularly risky research or, you know, even traveling or whatever, uh, you can protect your location privacy by using a VPN. Um, even some, like, you know, VPNs sometimes get a bad rep. Uh, I don't know why. I think they're really, really great. Uh, depending, I mean, of course, you have to choose the right one, but I do think that they're really, really great. Um, what it does, it, a VPN creates an encrypted connection. It's kind of like a tunnel between your computer and other computers on, in the world that um, are doing the internetting for you. So this uh, uh, serves a variety of purposes. One, it definitely does change your IP address. It makes you appear to websites that you visit, um, that you are coming from this other place in the world that you elect, uh, which is you know, the computer uh, that is owned and maintained by your VPN provider. Another cool thing about that is uh, this is actually how, when it works properly, VPNs are used by a lot of people in order to access things that are behind political firewalls. So um, being able to use, uh, check Gmail in China, being able to hear about and share news about an election um, elsewhere. Uh, when when uh, regimes cut uh, people's access to certain things on the internet, VPNs are the ways to you know, flip that switch right back on. Now, that said, not all VPNs are created equal. No, not at all. Um, there are certain VPNs out there that are lying about the protection that they provide and the, the service that they provide. Uh, there are VPN, and those are bad. There are VPNs out there that still log a lot of your data because if this computer is doing the interneting for you, it has access to you know all sorts of information about where you've been and what you've been looking at. Uh, and you have to find VPNs that have a stated um, commitment to protecting users' data, whether that means not logging at all 
in certain cases that that happens or um, if it means like if they are logging what is their data retention policy how long are they going to hold on to that data and what type of data is it exactly that they're holding on to there's a couple of other um, uh, metrics that we use for selecting a VPN and you can totally hit me up uh, afterwards for resources and and other things uh, and to have your questions asked there um, there's also Tor, which I like to call the people's VPN. Uh, similar to how a VPN works, um, the, uh, what Tor allows you to do uh, is to pretty much have another computer in the world do the internetting for you. And what's cool about Tor is that uh, the, your computer's data as it passes through that is triple encrypted to its final destination. And that provides complete anonymity between your computer and the computer at the, uh, at the end that's doing that internetting for you. Now, there are some caveats to Tor. Um, one uh, is that it's definitely not perfect. And so while the Tor developers really, really work very, very hard to make sure that the system still has you know, its integrity and is still working as well as it did when you know, it was first dreamed up, there are always going to be, um, uh, there's always going to be problems. There's always going to be bumps. Um, another thing about Tor is that because you know, we have this triple encryption here, uh, it can be a lot slower. Uh, video especially doesn't perform too well on it. And also um, because Tor definitely, I'm not going to lie, also gets a, a bad rep because of its anonymity. Uh, there have been plenty of instances um, where criminals use this to do pretty nefarious things. You can imagine the temptation. Um, but that said, I mean, especially where it's involved in like financial crimes, there are, uh, you know, uh, you definitely couldn't really do bank online banking over Tor because banks do not want Tor users uh, accessing bank accounts. So this is an example. Um, also, uh, the thing about anonymity is that you can provide technical anonymity, but there's still, you know, um, your personal value of anonymity. So while you definitely can um, access Facebook over Tor, and actually Facebook encourages you to do so, it was a really, really cool project they put together, um, that still means that like, you shouldn't expect anonymity because you're logging on to a Facebook account, and anonymity is the exact opposite of Facebook. So, um, but that said, um, having access to Facebook over Tor meant that a lot of people who are living behind political firewalls could actually get on to, you know, onto Facebook to connect to their friends. So these are all like toss-ups and trade-offs that now you have more, of, uh, more tools in order to make decisions about. All right, so, okay. So let's talk about communication. So I, we were talking about that model before with you know, the route to the internet, the service provider, our endpoints, right? Our phone, our computer as endpoints. Um, the thing about Facebook and the thing about Gmail and the thing about, I don't know, Dropbox or like what all of these systems um, is that the service provider in the middle has a lot of insight into what you are saying to other people. And in a lot of cases, this is to fuel advertising dollars, okay? Um, but another thing is that uh, if uh, ever records are requested for, you know, um, as, as um, in pursuit of uh, users' data, let's say um, under a subpoena or a warrant or something like that, all of these service providers don't have any choice but to comply. They're, I, I mean, sorry, to respond, not necessarily to comply. Companies like Google um, or Twitter, actually, uh, they have a, a better record about this. They do fight in their legal departments. They fight very, very hard not to have to give you know, um, data about users uh, to uh, you know, uh, just willy-nilly without merit. But it does happen, and it is something that all, you know, in order to operate a business, you would have to respond to. So with that said, um, that sometimes is just like not suitable. Uh, if I, so now we have what's called end-to-end -end encryption in order to ensure that only these endpoints have the ability 
to read the, the contents of things. Um, this is once again a technical assurance and still, you know, there, it's not necessarily a social assurance. We'll get to that. But this is exactly what it looks like. And so I wanted to, I, I always like to show people this because end-to-end -end encryption seems like a very abstract, almost magical idea, but it's not. Um, it, or, I mean, well, it's, it is great. It's magical in that sense, but it's not magic in that it doesn't exist. It's like just math and characters. Um, this is an example. Uh, I'm chatting with myself uh, using a protocol called uh, Jabber with what's called off the record or OTR um, plopped on top of it in order to provide this end to end encryption. OTR is a little bit old, but this was just, you know, just an example. Um, so I'm chatting like capital HH is uh, chatting with lowercase hh uh, because I don't actually have friends. I just do tests on how this stuff works. Um, but if ever uh, Google were uh, required to hand over chat history between these two endpoints, this is exactly what they would have to give. And they would have no way of turning that gobbledygook into something that's legible. And neither would anyone that they gave this information to. Actually, at this point, I can't even decrypt that because I don't have those computers anymore. Um, so. Uh, that said, there's like a billion different end-to-end um, -end, uh, encrypted uh, uh, software programs out there. By the way, end-to-end -end also requires that both you know, or all parties on the ends have the same ability to encrypt and decrypt. So um, at this point, you can't necessarily, um, you know, like you can't send an encrypted email to someone and expect them to be able to decrypt it on WhatsApp, right? Um, and we'll get into more of what that means. So uh, who here has heard of Signal? I, OK, so Signal is uh, an end-to-end -end encrypted app. It is for uh, mobile. It is also for you know, your desktop and all that stuff that provides end-to-end -end encrypted conversations um, between parties. Most people use it on their phones, actually. Um, but uh, Signal is not only this app that <laughs> pretty much none of you use, that's okay. Um, it's also a protocol. Uh, and what that means is that you have Signal the app, but the people who built Signal, ultimately they wanted to build something bigger than that. They wanted to actually um, just create a, a formula that anyone could apply because they have it open source and so it's readily available. Um, a formula that anyone can apply in order to uh, harness end-to-end -end encryption within whichever app they have. So while nobody here is using Signal, that's okay. Um, who here is using WhatsApp? Okay, so um, WhatsApp actually has literally the same end-to-end -end encryption inside of it as Signal. And the reason why is because WhatsApp you know, like heard about it, they were fans, they got together with the developers and they worked on implementing this end-to-end -end encryption in this app. WhatsApp and Signal are not interoperable though, but that's okay. Um, but so what's interesting about this is, well, there's two things. Um, because, so when I showed you that, um, there is, there's a couple of uh, pretty important things. We talked about how the internet works and you know, blah, blah, blah how service providers knows who things are to, who things are from. Hang out with Harlow Holmes. That's the subject of you know, this chat. That's not encrypted. Anybody can read that. Har uh, you know, capital um, Harlow, lowercase Harlow. My names are legible there. Anybody can read that. If I had an avatar, they, probably, they would have been able to see that too. There's a timestamp. So you know, there, the, a chat is happening at a certain time. And this is data that is not encrypted, that's not really going to get encrypted anytime soon, and is um, definitely, you know, like if someone had asked for these chat logs, that is information that somebody can use. So while well, I'm not talking about doing crimes at all, um, what's interesting here is that uh, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. Did you guys know that? OK, so <laughs> good. Um, so WhatsApp is owned by Facebook, and so that means that um, they're going to have a very, very different relationship and put a different price 
on that metadata between people than they would if you know, they're using Signal. Um, actually, I, a couple of months ago, there was a court case where Signal responded with you know, requests for information. And what they had to give was the fact that, like, yes, this user does exist. And this user checked, you know, used Signal um, at, at, at a certain time. But that was all they had in terms of metadata in, to, to hand over. So, um, but when you think about this, so, OK. <laughs> So on our y-axis, we have um, a, a way of thinking about all of these apps that are going to be offering great encryption and all that stuff. Um, thinking about it in terms of how they might do things like treat metadata or design their app in such a way that would affect exactly how useful it is. So Signal is, is like kind of over there, whereas uh, WhatsApp falls a little bit further because they definitely know that, or they definitely uh, handle much more richer metadata. On the x, uh, yeah, on the x-axis, we actually have to think about availability. Like, once again, I, you know, like only two people in this room can have a conversation over Signal. So if we really, really, really all needed to have an important conversation that we wanted to keep private, we'd probably switch to WhatsApp because that's where more people are. Um, I think the statistic is like 13% of uh, the globe is on WhatsApp. And so like that's actually a very, very substantial number of people. So whereas like, yes, the privacy issues, definitely a concern. Um, with, within WhatsApp. Also, WhatsApp will, uh, for iPhone users, by default, it will try to put all of your chats in iCloud. So <laughs> what's the point of having an end-to-end -end encrypted chat when like, there's a copy of it in your iCloud, right? So these are uh, design choices that affect how effective this can be. Um, who here is on Facebook Messenger? OK, fewer, interesting. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, Facebook Messenger actually has that same signal protocol in the encrypted chat feature uh, within their app. But once again, it's Facebook, so you know they have all that metadata, totally, uh, <laughs> and probably listening to what you're saying. Um, but uh, they, uh, they also like, you know, that chat feature is usually kind of difficult for people to find. Um, you can't use it on, on the on the web, you can only use it from the mobile app. Like all of these design choices uh, that Facebook made kind of brings it down in terms of how well this is going to be at preserving a private conversation. So once again, when people say like use Signal or whatever, like, you know, I mean, use Signal, it's great. I, I recommend it, but ultimately there's a reason why. And there's, and you know, if tomorrow Signal doesn't exist anymore, then you can still use this type of metric um, within threat modeling to make decisions about the next app that comes your way. So, signal, right? Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the social stuff. So, phishing um, is uh, a, a social engineering attack crafted to make you hand over credentials, like uh, you know, like Podesta, like happened to Podesta, like. Uh, download and install malware, which we're going to talk about too, um, or to divulge um, confidential info or like you know info about your social network, getting you know like tricking you into sending out spam emails to people in your address book that have links to you know like I don't know fake pills or something. All of these things all fall under the veil of phishing. Now there's phishing, which is like. Everybody's got some, if you should look in your spam folder to see how many like, you know, phishing attempts people get every day. And uh, you know, email providers like Google are really, really good at making sure those go straight to your, your spam folder and you never have to worry about them. Ultimately, uh, phishing attempts are never really personal. Spear phishing, however, is. Spear phishing is when you are targeted specifically because someone wants to um, get all of these things. So that's when you find, uh, you know, an adversary who is personally motivated by um, uh, to to get your assets, and it your threat model changes accordingly. Um, I've seen some like really really uh, interesting ones. Like sometimes, or, and especially if you're going for the whaling expedition. Okay, so 
Fishing is not personal. Spear phishing is personal. Cat phishing is when people do that to you over social media. And oh boy. Uh, and whaling expeditions is like all of that. Um, but like if you're like a really, really, really important person, like a CEO or something like that, or a John Podesta. Um, these, uh, in, in terms of like insidiousness, sometimes like, you know, someone will write plausible looking emails, craft a, an entire identity and a backstory and all this stuff um, in order to just finally, like after months of you know, cordial conversation, drop a link into your inbox um, that contains malware or something. And so sometimes these things are easy to spot, but it's not always. So this is actually a really, really interesting uh, story. Uh, <clears throat> Someone at an NGO was arrested. She was actually arrested, like, like literally, um, for, her, for her activist work. Within hours, every, all of her friends, everyone in her network received an email uh, that uh, is, you know, that was like this, um, saying, like, this is the, the arrest report of your friend. You should look at it. Here it is on Dropbox. So this is like a coordinated spear phishing attack um, that targeted all of these people, all of these NGO workers based off of the common knowledge that they had a friend in custody. Now, okay, so we are obviously we're noticing some like of the, the, the obvious telltale signs about, you know, phishing. Uh, the email address, dropbox.noreplay at gmail.com. And of course, no replay, haha, <laughs> bad spelling, OK? Um, gmail.com is a domain that does, has anything to do with Dropbox. So obviously, those should be red flags, blah, 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 right? OK, fine. Uh, but that's, and then you know you click through, and you are brought to a URL like that, a phishing page, obviously. How do we know? We know because um, actually it's not Dropbox or any URL associated with Dropbox. It's actually servehttp.com, right? OK, sure. U URLs can, this is um, what's similar to something called typo squatting, where people will buy up domains that are um, you know, like set up to, confu to confuse you into thinking that you're going to the service that you want. All right, what about the design? This is actually the Google login uh, you know, thing. So what does Dropbox have to do with the Google thing? OK, all these glaring red flags, right? Eh, this was an interesting one that I love. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is, so this is from, uh, or uh, this was a spear phishing challenge to some friends of mine and I uh, getting us to, because we make uh, apps uh, to click on the link, go to their you know, phishing page, and then like letting, um, I don't know, attackers take over the apps that we make, maybe even to distribute bad versions, uh, malware versions of those apps. I don't know, it's a disaster scenario. But gosh, three O's is not how you spell Google. Right? So this is typo squatting. This is a classic typo squatting uh, attack. And actually, Google's been really, really good. And a lot of these services have been good at like buying up you know, all of the URLs that look a little bit like theirs. But I love telling this story because actually, when I received this, I, I don't remember exactly which time it was. But like I was, I was at a bar. And I could have clicked on that you know, if I had had a couple more drinks. Facebook, OK. so at Actually, this is not a fish. <laughs> this is a legitimate thing from Facebook. But I didn't know, or I mean, well, I, I ultimately did. Um, Facebook mail was not the, the URL that I was expecting from Facebook. So, you know, that confused me. And also, like, if I clicked on it, that would just, I would, you know, I have these rules about like looking at the, the URL that things come from. By the way, all of these things can be spoofed. They can be spoofed. So it can come from your mother, or it can appear to come from your mother. But then when you drill deep down into how the, uh, the source of that email, it actually was someone else's entirely. So half, the, or not half the time, but like you shouldn't necessarily take the from um, text 
as like the real sender of a particular thing. Uh, Dropbox links, or sorry, uh, Google Drive links, even from legitimate contacts of yours. Uh, actually, this was a worm that was spreading, a, you know, a Gmail worm that was spreading a couple of months ago where someone from legit, your legitimate contacts sent an email saying like, click here to view the file. Or no, someone has shared a, a, an email with you over Google, or a document with you over Google Drive, click here. They go to this and they're brought to, oh yeah, it's the legitimate Google page. Sure, but what they're doing is the, they're actually, um, the uh, document that was going around was linked up to Google's special API and legitimately did this. Um, if you accepted, if you pressed accept, it would still, uh, this legitimate Google Drive document would have the access to read your email, to send email as you, to do all of these things. And that's actually not even a hacking trick. That's it goes in through the legitimate you know, tools that Google provides. And it's only the social engineering aspect that, you, that it relies upon in, to spread. So OK, we're going to look out for typos and bad grammar. We're going to look out for URLs that have no connection to the service, by the way. Um, always hover over links before clicking through to them. Beware of shortened URLs like bit.ly links or GL links or whatever, because you don't necessarily know what's behind them. Sure. Um, on mobile, it's long pressing um, in order to pop up the information bubble that says exactly where we're going, um, rather than you know just tapping on it. Um, that said, there's a caveat because some, especially these like really, really like um, tricky URLs, they're so long that you don't even actually see the entire uh, address anyways. So it's almost useless advice. Beware of unsolicited attachments, of course. Although I definitely do understand that sometimes people have to open attachments. Um, and beware of undue social pressure. So like what we had seen um, uh, in that Nile fish incident when uh, a phishing attack was coupled with a real life event. Um, I had someone, yeah, even, uh, or I had someone who was like, someone followed up to a phishing attack over the phone like very early in the morning trying to get her out of bed and groggy and like, OK, fine, I'll click on it. Like these are, you know, things. Yeah. But actually, you will not always be so vigilant. You won't. Um, as I had said that time that I like I I made this slide deck, but I could have gotten fish because I was at a bar or you will be babysitting and a kid will be crying or, you know, uh, there's a variety of reasons or you'll, you'll be tired or you'll just like make a mistake. Um, you won't always be so vigilant, so don't count on it. Um, the best thing to do, well, actually, there are two things. Uh, one is like if you receive a request, or sorry, an email about your account, whether it be Google or Facebook or Twitter or blah, blah. Um, one thing that I like to do is just kind of like make a mental note of it and say like, all right, Google sent me an email about something. And then I just open up my browser, manually type in you know, Google, and then let the notifications that are linked to my account take me to any place where I need to address the situation. Go in, go, elect to go to those services yourself and take care of your stuff that way. Another trick that I like, oh, before we do that, um, another trick that I like actually has to do with uh, inline images. So uh, if you turn off inline images from being automatically displayed in your email, uh, you will wipe out a lot of like you know the uh, the icons and all that stuff that's designed to trick you. So that's great. And also, um, every time you open up an email, this is actually like what Mailchimp pretty much pioneered. Every time you open up an email, whether you can see an image or not, because some of them are invisible, you're pretty much sending out a ping to the person who owns that image on the internet where you are because of your IP address maybe, what time you opened it, and like a whole bunch of other things. So um, this is good for you know, just protecting your own kind of privacy as well. So inline images, take them out, um, open the browser tab yourself, and manually navigate to the service. OK. Um, so another thing that 
Uh, let's, yeah, now let's talk about cameras really quickly and the data that they contain. Uh, Snapchat can be fun, uh, I guess. I don't kind of like it. Um, but one of the things that Snapchat does really, really well is like they make spying on you an event. Um, <laughs> Snapchat knows where you are because the app also has uh, access to your location data. It, might, it also has uh, access to your microphone because sometimes you, know, you film videos and things like that. And it, ambi it can ambiently listen to things around you. So actually, one time, uh, a friend of mine was showing me Snapchat, and there was a song by the Chainsmokers playing. And then autumn, all of a sudden, like she got the, the geo filter for it. And she's like, ooh, should I get it? And I'm like, no, it's listening to you. Oh, my god, no. Um, <laughs> but yes. But all of these things are part of like metadata. Once again, this is data about data, the who, the when, the, the whys, and the whats. Um, this is a funny story. Uh, about an article <laughs> that was written for Vice titled, we are with John McAfee right now, suckers. He was on the lam. He was like literally in hiding, running from the law. Um, and uh, he gave an interview to these Vice journalists. They published the photo that they took on their iPhone to, their, uh, to the magazine. And literally everyone in the world could look at what's called the EXIF photo metadata and see exactly where John McAfee was hiding. He was later arrested. He was very, very, he was, they found him. So this is uh, another um, example of how, you know, the, the, the participatory nature of, you know, our phones and they, these things are fun, uh, but they contain a lot more data than, than you'd expect. So these are a couple of like mobile things. Um, one is taking care of, of app permissions. Um, most newer versions of Android from Android 6 on up have what are called granular permissions. And so that means like I don't, even though like Snapchat or, you know, like Instagram or whatever is requesting my location and I still want to use Instagram and Snapchat or whatever, you can actually say, but it doesn't have access to my location. Uh, there are similar um, uh, tools in for uh, iOS users, so making use of your restrictions, which is pretty much the parental lock on the phone, but it's still like my favorite thing, um, in order to make sure that apps um, both request, like ex er, explicitly, um, uh, you can explicitly like not allow apps to take, uh, make use of certain assets like permissions when or after you've uh, downloaded and installed them. Um, and also to make sure that you're just at least, at the very least, notified of when these things are happening. Um, there's another cool thing that's been around for a while. Uh, this is for Android users only uh, called ObscuraCam, which uh, I really, really love this app in terms of like it, just on a philosophical level. What it is, is it's a camera app or you can use their camera or you can import, you know, uh, something that you took with like a better camera. That's fine. And it allows you to do two things. One, it allows you to um, just pixelate or even redact fully or draw a mask on or whatever uh, any uh, part of the image. And so this is really cool for people's privacy. Like you took a photo at a demonstration, but you're not, but it, it's, you can actually take a moment before you post this to, you know, Facebook or whatever to consider the privacy of people who are in the photo with you who did not give any consent to be part of this. Um, you, another cool thing that it does is, so like it only, not only redacts on the visual side, but also in the metadata. It wipes uh, photos of metadata. Um, so not only do we have like the visual redactions, but we're also preserving people's privacy within, and your own within metadata. Um, YouTube has a redact tool now. So um, if you are going to ever be posting video and you are concerned about uh, the, uh, preserving the privacy of people in said video, uh, YouTube has been working on a really, really smart tool over the past couple of years. It's finally at a ready-ish state um, for you to you know, do your own redactions uh, before posting. Um, all of this 
Yes. Oh, uh, sharing, you don't necessarily have to post. Because I, and one of the things that people, um, uh, or when you're speaking to people who, especially those who are filming in like kind of like hot zones or whatever, is that they don't want to lose the footage. Um, cameras can be broken. De equipment can be seized and forced and media forcibly deleted. And so getting um, media off of a phone it has been very, very important. Um, so a lot of people like I, I would just recommend before, you know, taking to Facebook or whatever, use an end to end encrypted uh, service in order to post that somewhere secure. So once you're back, you can like pull it down, do your redactions or whatever. Um, all of these resources uh, have are like the culmination of years of really, really excellent research and advocacy work by a group called Witness, um, which is Peter Gabriel's 25-year-old organization um, that's dedicated to teaching people how to video for, um, to be effective and uh, to, to be safe while doing so. So they have like a lot of really, really great resources about, you know, on location filming, doing sensitive interviews with consent and security in mind, filming protests, um, and uh, even basic video production. Um, and I, what I love about their, you know, tactic is that they have consent um, and security kind of baked in at the very, very beginning. Okay, finally, full disk encryption. Do it, it's so easy. Um, the, similar to what we were talking about, in, uh, about how, like, the, why the internet has uh, encryption in transit is because not only can things be looked at who you don't want them looking at it, but it can also be modified. And so this is the same thing. Th those are actually two very, very central themes within encryption, visibility and modification. Um, but so when you encrypt your computers with full disk encryption, you, uh, when your computer is off, you can rest assured that nobody can turn it on and look at stuff while your back is turned, and no one can add malware or you know, whatever while your back is turned. File Vault for Mac. Windows users, there is something called uh, BitLocker, um, which your computer may, or hopefully, will support. Um, but it depends on the model. And also, uh, the free version of Windows that comes by default installed on you know, every new computer that people buy, um, that needs to be upgraded to like a, the, either the Pro or Enterprise Edition in order to enable this. Um, so uh, things are changing. I haven't done all of my high Sierra research yet about full disk encryption for Mac computers, um, but there is like a little bit of a caveat about you know um, the key that you use to decrypt your computer syncing up to iCloud. Um, in uh, prior versions to Sierra, um, to High Sierra, that you you didn't have to um, get iCloud involved at all. Uh, it asks you whether or not you want to send your backup key to iCloud, and I never do. As long as you remember your administrative password to turn on your computer, you will have your encryption key. Phones are awesome. Um, Android, most Android phones now, especially nowadays, have uh, the ability to encrypt. Um, not all of them do, and some of them are just like really, really crappy, which, you know, that's a consumer choice. But have a look in the privacy and settings or uh, in security settings to make sure that you can encrypt your, your Android device. iOS already done. OK, so finally, how are we honoring our data? Let's get back to the idea of data love that um, was so succinctly uh, explained earlier. Um, first off, these are like two maxims. If you aren't paying for the product, you are the product. So you can uh, request your data profile from all of the big players to see exactly like what, not only what data they have about you, but like how they are monetizing it. So for instance, uh, this is like my Twitter um, uh, uh, advertisement data, which I requested. It takes two seconds. They will just send it to you. Um, these are all of the, or not all of these, these are some of the advertisers who are actively following me on Twitter to insert, you know, it, to influence my timeline, to insert their ads, et cetera, because I like Wendy's. I don't even know why. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 
So I and it was it's really really long. I haven't looked at all of them so far. I haven't seen anything like totally um, horrifying, but still, it's a lot of following. Um, <clears throat> check your internet permanent record, uh, especially for the Gmail users out there. Um, the uh, so. If you go to my uh, my account the my account section within uh, your Google Pro, uh, account and drill down to your web and application history, you will see literally your permanent record on the internet, or at least as long as you've been using a Gmail product. For Gmail users, this is turned on by default. But the good news is, is you can toggle it off, so it will stop gathering all this information. I can definitely not say that um, they're not taking information about users because they're like a bajillion dollar company. Of course they are. But um, this, you know, you do have some control over how it's used if you toggle it off. The same thing goes for your location history, for your YouTube history as well. And for Android users, um, be aware that like, for instance, um, because Google knows what time you uh, use the alarm clock app to press snooze or whatever, they have a really, really good idea of when you're waking up. That's just like only one thing that they know. And all of that is in your app history, and you can look at it. Um, something that's interesting about this, uh, especially from a metadata perspective, is that there is a lot of, I had a great slide, I'm sorry I didn't bring it. There is a lot of really, really rich metadata in services that we use that pretty much our content that winds up here. So things like hashtags, uh, things like even the full contents of a tweet, all of these, all of that, which you would think of as content and not metadata, these platforms are constructed on like the basic code level in such a way that this content becomes part of the actual HTML, you know, web metadata that companies like Google use in order to pad out this profile. So like literally you can, there are some places where you can literally see which tweets you have looked at, which hashtags you had followed, which events you had thought of going to. Finally, if you aren't sitting at the table, you're on the menu, which is a very cool phrase. I love it. Um, there are a variety of organizations out here <clears throat> who are working very, very hard for your digital rights on the political spectrum globally across the world and um, from like the consumer perspective and also on the technological perspective because so much comes from knowing exactly like where the little you know where the little exploits and loopholes are and addressing them head on so shout out to the electronic frontier foundation the eff uh, the aclu and uh, Mozilla. And there's a bunch of really, really excellent uh, other groups as well. But, so that's it. And I'm actually going to open it up for uh, some discussion and some food. And uh, please do keep in touch. Uh, I'll kick things off with a question from the control room. They wanted me to ask you. Uh, Early on, you were showing the Kaspersky site where you can check the viability of your passphrases. Mm -hmm. And they were trying it out on their uh, control room computer. And cool. they were not able to see the digits the way that you were. The, Which digits? The characters that they were typing in were just oh, yeah. as bullets on the yep, screen. Yep, yep, yep. You can um, toggle. So I uh, toggle the star here to turn it off and on. You got that, Jeffrey? Yeah. Thumbs up. <laughs> All right, other questions from the audience? Hi. Hello. My, my name is Karen Mascarinas, and I'm a research assistant at the COGOD Cybersecurity Governance Center. Cool. So one of the questions that I have was pertaining to one of the slides that you mentioned on the internet permanent record. Can you go back on like how we can access that so we can see how to do that? Yeah. Um, OK. So dip, dip. Uh, from a law, OK, this isn't, there's no um, account here. but. So from uh, any logged in, you know, Google account, you go to my account. There is no account here, but um, right here under personal info and privacy. And then there's uh, a couple of things here. The managing your activity, oops, uh, yeah, which actually takes you to um, the internet, internet permanent record. record. Okay. Yep. And also, uh, it 
has controls on how you can like you know toggle on and off the location stuff the youtube search history um anytime you've ever said okay google you know like find me a sandwich or whatever all of that they they actually store those audio files um so all of those things you can kind of take control over and does that apply to amazon alexa and other <laughs> um, voice operated ais as well um, so, uh, while I'm not 100% an expert on Alexa, uh, it is definitely, um, uh, er, you want to have a look at their privacy policies, um, because the, I mean, they're definitely, they do store a lot of, you know, our voice and our, like, you know, ambient room data and all those things. Um, it's really, really a question of how long they're re holding onto it before they like purge it. And what does a purge of that mean on a like, you know, from a legal perspective and also on a technical perspective? Because if that data is sitting in like pre deletion limbo, it's still, you know, accessible in some way or not. Um, and so uh, there's, I mean, like infamously, there was uh, like a murder case. Um, that did evolve Amazon because they were asked for, you know, like a certain uh, span of, you know, a suspect's, okay, Alexa, <laughs> okay, Alexa, hi, bury the body. Like, I mean, I don't know. Um, but another thing we're thinking about is, uh, as that story was reported on, one of the things that I felt was not as uh, reported was, in addition to Alexa, this person also had a, um, a water meter that, uh, who, whose data was uh, asked for, um, and that proves how much water was used to like swab down a deck, um, which is, you know, I mean, like as our, we're, le we're now leaving the, um, the era of like, uh, we're now in an era where we are no longer, we no longer have the choice whether or not to appear before computers. And this is only like one example of that. We had another question. I have a question about the password manager that mm -hmm. you recommended. I couldn't even quantify how many passwords I have, so it's very appealing. Yeah. But I'm also extremely wary about having all of the passwords in one place. Mm -hmm. It seems like every time there's something that's designed to centralize that and keep it in one place, there's a hack, and then they have everything. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about which ones would be the most secure, and do you have do you share any of those concerns about having that um, single point of failure? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I definitely do agree to that question. It's a great question. So when um, with the password managers and also with like all of the recommendations that we make um, uh, in this field um, is based off of a couple of things. So uh, one has to do with like you know the integrity of the software. Um, all software is definitely imperfect and LastPass for instance is no stranger to bugs um, that you know like uh, the browser extension being like a as you say like a, a point where someone can you know with malicious code reach in and grab a whole bunch of passwords um, when these flaws are found by security researchers LastPass gets really 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 um, uh, they did a really great job in responding to those in a timely manner and in a, in a transparent manner um, so there's that. Uh, another thing about the passwords, um, all of the password managers, whichever one that you choose, um, those are encrypted in, in the cloud. So in the event of like a massive data breach where hackers get into LastPass's servers and pull down everyone's passwords, those are encrypted. Well, uh, and so ultimately, um, you um, encrypted with your you know passphrase. Uh, so in which case, hackers would be pulling down just encrypted blobs that they couldn't really make use of, um, I mean, in, you know, for the most part. Uh, but, and then there's also, you know, the, the denial, uh, denial of service, so, um, which is another uh, term um, that can be equally damaging. And in which case uh, there are, so one password actually has really, really good like local syncing. Um, you also, I also mentioned uh, KeyPassX, which is an offline password manager um, that is kept as like a single file or you know whatever on your own on a machine of your choosing, which means you could back it up to like a um, a USB stick that you've buried in your backyard or something like that. I've done that. Um, so uh, and also, if you wanted to, you can use a commercial uh, cloud storage provider like Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that to stick 
uh, a copy of your uh, encrypted password database for redundancy. So at this point, um, redundancy, or sorry, resilience rather, is possible. Uh, it's just, it takes like a little bit of working with it. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions for Harlow in the room? Hi, I'm Erika from the School of Communication. I'm really overwhelmed, you know, I seriously am. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm a kind of medium sophisticated user yeah. of uh, technology. So I'm just wondering how effective all this information is uh, with people who just aren't sophisticated users of the technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, that's a Excellent question as well, and I even feel uh, overwhelmed at times too. Uh, and that's, I mean, just like on a philosophical level, uh, the more complexity there is, the more complexity you're going to have to, you're going to burden yourself with. And it just so happens that like technology and our relationship to devices have added a lot of complexity. And yeah, we have to deal with it. Um, in ter so uh, I think like the history of a lot of these. Uh, T technologies, the circumvention tools, like the end-to-end -end encryption, the two-factor authentication, all of these things actually do have like a, a long history um, um, where they've worked with, you know, various communities of users in order to get to where they are now. And I assume they will get better. Um, so for instance, YubiKey, the, the, the USB thing, that being like the most secure um, um, two-factor off solution that you can get so far. I actually, in training, I've noticed that like um, it works really well with elderly users because it has like the, the physicality of a key. Of course, there's like, you know, the issue of like, I lost my key and blah, blah, blah. I'm, you know, that's fine. Um, it happens. Um, but that, uh, that like there is, you know, just kind of like a, a a psychological attachment to um, the, the physicality of the object that I thought was like incredibly, uh, yeah, I mean, it was interesting, incredibly interesting. Um, there will be, uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about like the technically unsophisticated, but um, they're uh, working with, um, you know, like our digital afterlives, like what happens when we all become too senile and we have to go back to like our 50 year old Gmail account. Like those things are becoming, there's more and more of a cottage industry actually going, growing around it. And it's just gonna have to get better. I'm gonna close out with a tough question. Sure. Um, so, so I opened up with the concept of data love, which you know, um, I used as a kind of stand-in for this notion of, of you know, developing a, a culture of respect through data and mutual dignity and ritual through data. And you mentioned a bunch of instances over the course of the last hour where that came into play, where that was part of the mix alongside all the cool tech and tips and tricks that you showed us. Um, I guess my larger question to you is, you know, I remember reading a Cory Doctorow novel called uh, Little Brother. I love that one. Oh, it's a really good novel, book, yeah. right? He wrote it about 10 years ago. And there's a great scene where all these, it takes place about now, but it was written about 10 years ago, where all these teenagers uh, kind of get together. They're being um, hounded and hunted by uh, the National Security Agency for nefarious reasons, and they're trying to uh, cover their data tracks. And they get together and collectively destroy a hard drive. And there's a ritualistic dimension to that mm -hmm. that I love. It's not just about the tech of making sure the data is dead. It's about taking the web of trust between the individuals and making sure that they witness each other witnessing each other destroying the hard drive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I guess my question to you is like, I'm so freak, and my level of expertise in this stuff falls like way short of yours. And you yet, did pretty okay. <laughs> I often find myself being, you know, the, the Harlow in the room Right, the person kind of nudging the other people into adopting uh, more secure technologies. And I, I'm tired of being that person. Mm -hmm. Like, my question to you is, have you, as this proselytizer for, for security and for data love, have you developed any, um, do you have any recommendations for us as to how to be better data lovers, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I, I think that um, you mentioned, or your, your reference to the ritual 
Um, and, and actually, there's an inverse to that, or rather about destruction, but about preserving via web of trust. Um, has to do with like, OK, we didn't talk about this today, but who here has used PGP before? Yeah. OK, so PGP is like this 90s uh, era um, and still awesome today uh, protocol for encrypting things. Once again, an end to end encrypted in encryption scheme, one of like the, the original ones. Um, or that was useful. Uh, and so what people do in because like as another thing that I've said um, is that in encryption, there is always like there's these kind of reciprocal functions. There's encrypting things and decrypting things, but there's also verifying things and signing things, like making sure that you can trust. Uh, and there is like a lovely ritual uh, called a key signing party uh, where people will come together and they will read aloud this 40 character string that represents their identity. And then they, um, you know, because you've established that trust with a person, you then tell your computer that you have established that trust by like, and so I think that that's such an interesting idea. Um, and so like sharing your ability to trust other people with computers is increasingly important, especially because you know, of the, the attacks um, based off of phishing and other social engineering. When things get hacked or when things just break, um, having the maintaining our uh, ability to trust one another is fundamentally more important. Um, I'll, I'll add one uh, example of data love that I think is really, really great is like actually how like Signal and WhatsApp and I think even like, although I wouldn't use it, um, but like WeChat, you know, China's um, internet pretty much works, is that in order to establish trust in someone else, you have, there is a ritual of like scanning one, other, one another's QR codes. And that's something that can only be done in, well, I mean, not only, but like for the most part, can only be done in person in physical space. And yet it's the only way that you can tell a computer about your trust relationship with people. And so I, I, I encourage anyone who's you know, developing um, to think about those experiences and to bake those into the things that you build. Great answer. Um, thank you for that, and thank you for a really illuminating hour and a half. A uh, huge round of applause for Harlow thank Holmes you. from the Freedom of the Press Foundation. And I hope you will come back and re-educate us oh, and yeah. lead more clinics in the future. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's food and drink outside. Eat, drink, and be merry. Thank you all for being here. And thanks to Jeffrey Madison for helping to pull this whole thing together. Thank you. And thanks to the Internet Governance Lab for your support.